M6. Talk about Messier 6, so somewhere near the beginning of the catalog. What's it called? Uh, it's, it's called, what is it called? It's called the Butterfly Cluster. Um, and so supposedly because it looks a bit like a butterfly when you look at it. So it's not like a cluster of butterflies, it's a cluster no. that looks like a butterfly. It is a cluster that looks like a butterfly, hence the butterfly cluster, yeah. So it is actually an interesting cluster in that, so here's a picture of it, and the most notable thing about it from an astronomer's point of view is it's full of blue stars, which immediately tells you that it's a relatively young cluster, it's about 80 million years old or so on, which you know in an astronomical scale of things is pretty young. But the, th the other thing that screams out of this picture when I look at it is there is this one star here, which is actually a of the cluster it's not just something that happens to lie along the same line of sight which is red how do you know it's not in the foreground or typically a cluster of stars are all going to be moving relative to the background of stars and they're all moving together because there actually are a physical cluster of stars and so actually over time you can measure this thing called proper motion and measure how the cluster's moving you can also measure the radial velocity measure the doppler shift on the star so you can see how fast the cluster's moving towards us or away from us and so they kind of all move together in the sky and this this star is moving at the same speed so it's almost certainly a member of the cluster. We've looked at quite a few clusters now, and it's the same story in every case. What happens is you've got a cluster of stars with different masses. The most massive stars are the blue ones, and they're the ones that have the shortest lifetime. And so whenever you see these blue stars, that's telling you this has to be a young cluster of stars because it's still got these massive blue stars in it, and they would have died quite soon. But the way they die is, initially at least, they turn from being blue stars into being red stars. So they turn from, from blue main sequence stars, so the normal stars in the cluster, into red giant stars. So we're, one of, we're watching one of those stars going through its death throes. It's pretty much the end of the line. All the stars in this cluster don't live very long, but this one is, you know, really is on the way out at this point. Someone has to die first, but there's no reason that one will die before the others, like when they'll like, is there any story to that? Yeah, I mean, it is. They do it in mass order, right? It's the, it really is. The, the more massive you are as a star, the, the shorter your lifetime. And so really, when the, the, the most massive things go first, and then they just work their way down in mass. And so we just happen to reach the point where this star is the most massive one in the cluster, so it's on the way out. How did they end up as a cluster? Why are they clustered? Because they were born that way. So what happens is you've got some cloud of gas which started to collapse and form stars. And so really it's just the, the remnants of that cloud of gas is that the stars that form from it. So they, they just remember that they all form from a single cloud, so they kind of stick together at that point. All stars form from clouds though, don't they? So does that mean all stars are in clusters? Almost certainly, yeah. We've never yet found any star forming truly in isolation. Now clusters come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and some are bigger and some are smaller. So this is a few hundred stars, they go up to sort of some thousands of stars, and the, the small end, maybe you can have a very small cluster forming of 20 or 30 stars. But yes, they all seem to form in these clusters. Are we in a cluster? Not anymore. So over time these clusters dissolve, you know, stars escape and so on. Um, so actually we're not any longer a member of a cluster, but almost certainly the sun formed in a cluster of stars as well. So uh, an interesting question is we know a lot about this cluster because we really can study the individual stars in it in detail and figure out where the main sequence lies and what the most massive star is that's still there and all that kind of stuff, which gives us very good estimates of how far away the cluster is, what age it is and all those kinds of things. But of course most of the universe that we can study is a lot further away than this is, this is within the Milky Way. And it might be interesting to ask what's happening with clusters in, in other galaxies. Now typically in another galaxy, you're never going to see a picture as beautiful as this. A cluster like this is going to appear as a single fuzzy blob because all the light will all get mixed up together at the resolution we can actually measure. You're not going to be able to pick out the individual stars. You'll just see that there's something a bit fuzzy there. And so one interesting question is, could we actually learn something about clusters like M6 if we were studying them in other galaxies to see whether their stellar populations form in the same way that the Milky Ways do? Professor, can we pick off clusters in other galaxies. We do even have that resolution to say, oh look, there's a cluster within another galaxy. Oh yes, we can certainly see them, and, and you do get this state, you can tell they're not individual bright objects, because they're a little bit resolved there, you know, you can see they're a little bit extended, even in other galaxies. So actually we can find these kinds of clusters, particularly in nearby galaxies, it's fairly straightforward to do. In fact, in nearby galaxies, we can even pick out the individual stars with some of the best telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope. But as you go that little bit further away, they become these sort of unresolved blobs, and so actually then it becomes a bit harder to understand what stage they're at at their evolution, how they formed. There's an obvious thing to do, which is, as I say, that if you see blue stars, that tells you a cluster's young. If you see red stars, that tells you a cluster's old. Um, and so an obvious thing to do is just measure the colour of a cluster in another galaxy, because even if we can't resolve the individual stars, you'll be able to get a colour for the sort of sum of all the stars. And if that appears blue, then that tells you that it's got to be a youngish cluster. If that appears red, it tells you it's got to be an oldish cluster. So pro problem solved then, we just, we can just look at the colour and say, 
Okay, that's how old it is. Kind of, and people have done that because it's an interesting exercise to go through of pretending the Milky Way was a long way away and saying, okay, supposing we studied, because there we know the answer because we can make these detailed studies, supposing we were to degrade things to the way that we'd see it if it were another galaxy, can we then use that to kind of predict the ages of things? And uh, People have done, gone through that exercise. So there's a paper from a few years ago now that was doing exactly that. And the answer is it kind of works. Okay, so, so here's the, is, if you like, this is the, the key plot from their, from their paper. And so this is basically, this is a, so we've had colour magnitude diagrams before. This is a thing called a colour-colour diagram. And it's measured the amount of ultra ultraviolet light versus blue light on this axis and the amount of blue light versus green light on this axis. And so basically, um, let's get this right way round, blue things will tend to be high up here and over this side here, red things will be over here and down here. So red things down there, blue things up there. Different data points here are different clusters from the Milky Way that have been degraded in this way and just measuring a single integrated colour, or rather two colours for the whole cluster. And then the lines are various different models they fitted in there, allowing for different possible ages and different amounts of this reddening effect to try and, and, and uh, figure out what the answer is. And there is our cluster M6. I managed to figure out which point it is. It's that one down there. What do, what, and what do we take from this, so, and, and with M6 in particular? So the answer is that in general terms it works, but in specifics it doesn't quite. So as I said that M6 is about 70 or 80 million years old. If you actually apply this method to it and try and figure out a best estimate for the age, the answer comes out at about 130 million years old. So it's quite a bit older. I mean, you know, it's still very young. They both say it's a young cluster and, it, and you know, every measurement would agree on that, but actually in detail it doesn't agree. And it turns out the reason it doesn't agree, I think, is actually quite interesting, which is it comes back to that red star again, that single red star. In that if you go through this process of saying, okay, so let's calculate what we'd expect for a cluster of a particular age, if you happen to pick, up, pick the parameters of M6, you come to the conclusion that there should probably be about a half a star in that state, in that you know, evolutionary state. Or put another way, about half the time you should catch a star at that particular point, right? 50-50 chance of a red star. This kind of, and so if you do a kind of an, an average calculation that says on average what would we expect to see, the answer is not quite what we actually see because you can never see half a star, right? And so actually either you see a star or you don't see a star. Because we happen to have caught this cluster at a point where you do see that red star, that means that the cluster overall is a bit redder than the models would predict it would be because we just happen to have caught a whole star rather than half a star at that point. And because it's a bit redder than we predict it, then, then when we come to do the age calculation, we end up with an age which is a bit too old. Um, so it's actually quite interesting, and it's actually the conclusion of this paper is that this method kind of works, but the numbers of stars you see in a cluster like this are sufficiently small that you're actually at the, at the mercy of these kind of random effects as to whether you happen to catch a star at a particular point in its evolution or not. So it's like I ask you, what's the average age of the people in that nightclub? and you go in just at the moment that an old grandma happens to be walking through. Absolutely, yeah. No, that's absolutely, or, you know, the classic question people ask is, what's the average number of legs that a person has? And the answer is like, you know, 1.9 something or other, because actually not everyone has two legs. But of course, nobody actually has that average. You never actually see the average. And so if you're not careful when you're using those kind of statistics, you end up with, with a slightly silly answer, because actually, even though that's the average, it's not something you ever see in practice. M67 is the oldest cluster in the Messier catalogue. It's quite faint. You need a pair of binoculars to be able to see it as a misty patch. And it tends to get overlooked because of its brighter companion in the constellation, which is M44, the beehive cluster, which is much brighter and easier to see. 